Thank you very much, and um, thank you for coming in such numbers to this, uh, what promises to be a very thought-provoking session this afternoon on the end of empire. So we've had several conversations and sessions on decolonization, what it means, what it means for our collections, is it, are they our collections, etc. What this panel um, uh, will bring you is a perspective um, that also comes from outside the UK. And I think that's ever so important in these conversations. Um, the three speakers, which I will introduce in turn, will speak um, uh, and provide you their perspectives. And then after they've spoken, um, we'll have a discussion and a chance for you to ask questions. So before I hand over to our first speaker, I just wanted to share um, a personal anecdote um, that I experienced in a museum gallery um, in the, on the eastern Cape of Aotearoa, or New Zealand, two years ago. And uh, it was in Tairawhiti Museum, which is in a town called Gisborne, in the Moana Gallery, which looks at the um, conquest and colonization of Captain Cook anniversaries this year, very much in the news. And I overheard this, and it struck me um, so completely that I wrote it down uh, immediately, and I often revisit it. Um, the uh, quote is from a woman who had visited, who was visiting the museum in this particular gallery about Captain Cook with her young son. She said, they came here in their boats and they shot our people. Gisborne wasn't discovered by him either. We were already here. And they sent us off to war thinking we wouldn't come back so they could steal our land. You've got to get your history right. So with that, I'd like to hand over to our first speaker, Mira Sabratanam, Senior Lecturer in International Relations at SOAS, and also the Chair of SOAS's Working Group on Decolonization. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, it's a delight to uh, be here. Um, I'm not at all an insider in the museum's world, so it's very exciting to be somewhere new, an explorer, maybe uh, trying to conquer new lands. Um, <laughs> I'll try not to make too many colonization puns. Uh, my field of research is international relations, um, but I think I was asked here in my capacity as chair of the Decolonizing the University Working Group uh, at SOAS, which has been active for two or three years now, and we've been taking forward a number of actions within the institution to try and realize this quite utopian vision of what it means to uh, decolonize. And of course, as we know, this is part of a global movement for change that is attempting to transform societies to become more inclusive and equal in ways which specifically relate to these historical injustices. It's not a sort of bland, empty sense of equality and inclusion, but it's saying these specific kinds of things happened and we need to recognize and engage with that. Now, for some people, this conversation and these changes feel very rapid and it, that it's come from nowhere and they're sort of taken aback uh, from it. Um, for others, this change has been sought for, struggled for, for decades and has been very, very slow in the realisation. And in education, as I'm sure you're finding in the museum sector, these two kinds of um, uh, displacements are very uh, profound and can colour our conversations. So what is the problem that we're trying to overcome? I think questions of coloniality and decolonization are context specific, and I'll speak to the British one. Uh, Britain has issues which are distinctive and come from being the historic center of the largest empire on earth, only recently shrunk uh, and never, so it is perceived, actually defeated, right? And this is unlike uh, a number of other imperial projects or um, uh, nations defeated in war. British political practices and public culture have never been consciously reoriented from its imperial and racialized sense of supremacy and superiority. Even if overt elements of that receded from view and were, at least temporarily, replaced by a more liberal narrative about globalization and multiculturalism and particularly London as a sort of world city. And I'm thinking of the Blair years and Cruel Britannia and all of that kind of thing. Now, one important facilitating element of this is amnesia and ignorance. We are actually quite badly educated about empire, and we're even quite badly educated about things like World War II, which we think we know about. And that's before we even get to uh, the completely erased histories of settler, coloni settler colonialism and the kinds of genocidal practices that were entailed. 
So this is a big structural, historical problem that's fed through into lots of areas of public life. How is this manifested in higher education? So the diagnostic that I guess we've achieved and realized in higher education um, is that we're starting to ask lots of questions about different elements of what we do. And these are ultimately questions about power and authority. So we look at the epistemological underpinnings of our field and their division. Who writes, who speaks, and who studies, and for what purposes? We can think of the ways in which that purported uh, distinction between the modern and the savage was institutionalized in the distinction of uh, disciplines such as anthropology and sociology, in which we use the language of developed and developing again to distinguish different kinds of societies from each other. And we assume that what holds in one will not hold in the other because these are ultimately different places. And yet developed societies are seen as the archetype, the normal, the thing to which social sciences eventually uh, lead towards. So this is at a very profound epistemological level. Within the architecture of our uh, education structures, who is represented as core on the reading list, right? What is erased, what is suppressed, what is seen as not scholarly? Methodologically, how do we undertake research and how do we design it? Is it with consent? Is it with collaboration? Is it through the objectification of peoples and societies? And of course, we have students and one of the most striking um, Statistics that has been coming out uh, recently has been the award gap in uh, students who are differently racialized, particularly students who are black racialized, have much worse outcomes at university, even when they come out, uh, even when they enter university with the same grades as white students. So this asks a different set of questions about for whom is the university? Who is made to feel like they belong? Who is treated well and gets the benefit of the doubt? And then we look at the labor structures within the university, how are different kinds of labor valued and what's taken for granted. So within our sector, we can see a number of cross-cutting issues. And in our working group, the Decolonizing SOAS working group, we set out a vision for the institution which attended to teaching and learning, research, human resource practices, forms of our public engagement and our international partnerships. And so we want to try and transform all of these elements. And this was formally adopted as institutional policy in 2017. <clears throat> what we've been trying to do as well is just flesh out in this context what decolonization actually means. And I think I want to emphasize two elements of it, right? It has to constitute a recognition of the exclusions, dispossessions, and inequalities wrought by colonialism, as well as a reparative ethos and sense of its future possibilities. Sometimes institutions like to divorce these or do one without doing the other. So we might have a fund for black scholars, but we're not actually going to say it's because black scholars have faced discrimination and injustice. Or we might have an apology or an acknowledgement that this item can came from a problematic provenance, but we're not going to give it back, right, or something like that. So linking these two elements, recognition and reparation, I think are fundamental to when we talk about decolonization, what this means. Sorry, how long have I got? Three minutes, okay. Good. All right, so I'm not a uh, museum uh, professional at all, but I am an amateur lover of museums. And um, I wanted to just highlight some ideas from our own discussions within education that I think might be useful or maybe conversations that you're already having. The first idea is a move from objects to subjects, and I mean subjects in a grammatical sense. So I want to pick up a point made by Tamina writing on the curatorial research blog this week. And she says that museums are, by their very nature, vessels for objectification. Now, from a political angle, various people, including myself, have written about decolonization as the struggle for subjecthood, right? Not objectification, but subjecthood. That is the realization of one's own historical presence, rights, consciousness, narratives, material being, and so forth. So a decolonizing space is ultimately not one dominated by a single subjectivity or monologue, and particularly one of mastery, but one in which the sovereignty and the right to belong are shared by many, and in which the very act of sharing uh, actually transforms relations amongst them. Could museums pivot from presenting objects to facilitating the representation of subjects? What would this look like? I've often wondered what the British Museum's history of the world in 100 objects would have been if it had been a history of the world in 100 subjects, right? How would that have changed the relations of the listeners and uh, of what the museum was actually doing? Now, I enjoyed this first series in its entirety. But can we imagine museums as different kind of places? And I think some of the work done, particularly by black heritage curators, about thinking beyond the object and into experience and into subjectivities in non-kind of material forms are really important. 
Second, and following Gaminda Bambra's thinking about the university, we need to emphasize that decolonizing the museum is an act of democratizing the museum. That is making it a properly public space. And so one of the things that we're doing when we talk about decolonization is saying that there is a bigger public here to whom we have uh, responsibilities and who also have rights. And this is a particularly tense question in a post-imperial space, particularly the idea that British institutions have publics which are not just the British government, right, but are actually this wider world of peoples from whom objects originate and to whom they have relations. Third, and uh, um, following on for this, uh, I want to just say something about restitution. And there's been a lot of discussion of restitution of objects. But I think that there's an opportunity for thinking about reparative practice of the museums themselves, right, that needs to be understood. Can the museum itself be restituted to this bigger public? Who are the leaders and authors and curators of the space? How are the resources distributed? Who has the opportunity to shape them? Who are they accountable to, crucially, and how? And how could the physical infrastructure of the museum itself be used in a reparative spirit, which communities get to claim the use of the spaces? Fourth, and very finally, I just wanted to um, respond a little bit to some of the arguments made by Tristan Hunt in the context of the decolonization debate, in which he, in which he made an important point, and he said, well, it's an important point in the sense of the debate, he said that we need to sort of get over this phase of restitution. Somehow it's culturally essentialist, and drawing on Edward Said, he said, actually, the world is full of entanglement, and we need to kind of recognize that, and there need to be global museums all around the world. And I want to say that the issue here is that trying to skip to a post-decolonization outcome without going through the process of transforming the power relations that underpin it cannot deal with these basic problems, which are about sharing of power, accountability, voice, possession, and so on. So the new universals that are envisaged by people such as Fanon um, at the end of The Wretched of the Earth is only possible once the humility of the oppressor has been achieved and the humanity of the oppressed has been restored. So Said was a cosmopolitan, but he's also an advocate of Palestinian rights. Without your own home, how can you be hospitable? If you don't have possession of your heritage, how can you share it with others? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mira. Um, moving swiftly on to our second speaker, Stein Schoenewerd, who is the General Director of the National Museum of World Cultures, the Tropen Museum in Amsterdam. Over to you. Thank you. Football. <laughs> Football matches between the Netherlands and Germany used to be full of hatred and aggression. And that never, never happened when we played Guido's home country, Belgium, our other neighbor or when we played England. And that is not because England usually has such a weak team that we don't, <laughs> don't even bother. <laughs> Only when we played against Germany, something strange happened to the Dutch. We became nasty. It was also very peculiar that there were banners on the stands and people wearing t-shirts stating, we want our bikes back. Give us back our bikes, it says in German. This you can order online. <laughs> and you may know that the Germans took our bicycles during World War II. And you may also know that a bike is quite a symbol of Dutch identity. We were only occupied by the Germans for five years. And except for the Jewish community, the regime of the Germans was rather moderate, at least compared to how the Dutch themselves ruled Indonesia, their colony. This week, we opened an exhibition in our venue in Rotterdam that deals with this, this history, the Dutch Indie history. And what you see and learn there is actually rather shocking. But even these five years, of German occupation were enough to install in the Dutch, in the Dutch DNA, a sort of basic understanding that people, that a nation, may want objects back that were taken under foreign rule. Why it took the Dutch so long to open their eyes to their own colonial rule and acknowledge the war crime that were committed in the name of their country is another matter. United Kingdom, was also a colonizer and an aggressor, but it was never occupied. 
not really. And I sometimes wonder if that plays a role in the way the discussion about repatriation takes shape here in the UK. In the UK. I heard a well-respected colleague from a museum here saying, we can discuss anything as long as it is not restitution. We, the National Museums of World Culture, consisting of the four World Culture Museums in the Netherlands now, we do not think we are truly decolonizing our museums if we do not address the single most clear residue of colonialism in our museum, the fact that many of our collections have been collected as part of a system that was built on exploitation and violence. We took the issue of colonial collections head on. Earlier this year, we published a document called Return of Cultural Objects, Principles and Process. The document sets out the principles we think are relevant for judging claims and describes the procedure we will apply in answering these claims. We don't take the final decision about repatriation. That is and will always be the responsibility of the owner of the collection, which in our case is the state. But what our framework does do is describe the principles we apply when advising the minister on such claims. And looking for these principles actually turned out to be the easy part. Because nations have, oh, nations uh, and uh, nation states have already accepted a number of principles in various types of international treaties and declarations, and even in Dutch law, like you don't take cultural objects in a war situation. We send back items from Syria because they were collected in a war situation. And isn't that principle always a principle? Isn't that what makes a principle a principle? So why don't we apply these principles on colonial collecting, which is our proposition? When we published the framework, the general response of the Dutch public towards that framework, towards the idea of being open to giving things back, was rather sympathetic. Bikes or Benin bronzes, their histories are incomparable, but the principle at stake may be the same. And of course, the reactions in politics were cautious at first. But meanwhile, the responsible minister has formed a national committee to develop a national policy that should be ready end of next year. And we are happy to participate in that committee. In the earlier session that took on here today, the complexity of the object's history was mentioned, and also that the object and its country of origin has moved on since it ended up in Europe. So yes, it is immensely complex, but we think the best way to deal with that complexity is to move beyond theorizing, beyond thinking, and start on working on concrete cases and preferably on the basis of actual claims that are made by countries of origin or people or communities. Not slogans, not sweeping statements, but specific claims that also state a specific claimant. And it may sound to you that I suggest that it's just a matter of just doing it like the Nike slogan, just do it. And that's what very often activists tell us or the media seem to suggest. You just have to do it. Is it that easy? Hell no, it isn't. And will it take decades to sort this, this out? Probably it will. But decolonization in all its form is never easy, as many of you probably already know from personal experience. When you commit yourself to a process to address the afterlife of colonialism, in all its practices, buildings, and collections, pledged to become more inclusive and responsible, to address the afterlives of colonialism in concepts of racial representation and discrimination that still live on, you better prepare for a rocky ride. <coughs> Two examples from the Netherlands for that rocky ride. Yesterday, at the Dutch Museum Associations Congress, that takes place exactly in the same week, 
Dutch activist and founder of the Black Archives in Amsterdam, Mitchell Isaias, spoke about we the Dutch usually refer to as the Golden Age, the 17th century. The Golden Age, a word that is present in all the famous Dutch art museums with their glorious masters of Dutch painting. When our little country was the most powerful nation in the world, ruling the waves with our East Indian company. A golden age, but not for my ancestors, Mitchell Assize argued. They were enslaved in that same age. They were shipped on a Dutch ship from Africa to Suriname as mere commodities. When your museums call that a golden age, I do not feel welcome here. And neither do the other descendants of enslaved people that make up for the super diverse society we have in our uh, cities. So for that reason, the Amsterdam Museum, the local city museum in Amsterdam, has announced two weeks ago that they will no longer use the words golden age in describing the 17th century. And they were praised by many on one side of society and heavily criticized by the other, even by the prime minister who at the weekly press conference announced that he found it completely ridiculous. They got thousands of emails from angry people. They lost financial supporters and they gained support from others in return. A rocky ride over just two words. But words matter. We ourselves examined and rewrote many of our museum texts, a project that eventually led us to publish a book about colonial words that are often used in museums. And that's the one. We call it work in progress because that's what it is. It states the origins of these colonial words, their potential sensitivities to whom and why, and gives alternatives. In preparing for a rocky ride, we spent hours with a professional media company to develop a media strategy because we wanted the book to be launched in the media in the precise nuanced way we had written it, not accusatory, not normative. It paid off, and we were happy with how it was um, recepted. The book is available online, uh, and we invite everyone, also you here, to comment, to add words to it. The golden age, those words are not in it. We're not an art museum. We didn't use the word. It will be in the next edition we will publish next year. Decolonization is not an easy process. Yesterday, one minute, at the Dutch Museum Congress, the director of the City Museum in Schiedam spoke on how she managed to really connect the people of her very difficult city to the museum, becoming a home for literally everyone. It's the best example I know of a truly democratizing museum. But then she shared with us her immense dilemma. What if being home to everyone also means that a large part of your populations want to celebrate Sinterklaas? This typically Dutch tradition of a white saint that arrives on the 5th of December from Spain to give presents to all children together with his rather stupid black servant, Pete. Pete, a figure that has been under growing criticism for being a racist element, a clear example of a colonial practice that still lives on today. A well-loved tradition, even heralded by the Prime Minister's party. And can you really be a museum that has gained the trust of all the people by literally stating that you don't tell them what they should think or like, and then say, I can't have that part of our city celebrating this tradition? If colonialism is essentially a domination of one way of thinking over others, wouldn't it be exactly the same when that museum would say that their way of looking at the world should prevail and this event could not take place. These are the dilemmas that keep you awake at night when you embark on decolonization, and they should. You need to be willing to take on that rocky ride in every way possible. There's no easy way out, and the elephants in the room are multiple. And in closing, I would like to share with you, no bike was ever returned from Germany. <laughs> Thank you.
keep your uh, listening ears open for our final speaker of this afternoon's panel, Bruno Verbrecht from the Royal Museum for Central Africa in Belgium. Thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me here. Um, you have to know I'm uh, coming to explain what we did at the Africa Museum in Belgium, but at the same time, from uh, the grass is always greener on the other side, we look very much towards uh, Great Britain on how you have a long history of involving communities and opening up the discussion, and that we have the feeling that uh, we are always lagging uh, behind. The, um, I will be a little bit more pragmatic, maybe, and just explain uh, what we did and, um, and what our problems uh, uh, were, what our challenges were, um, uh, to be, and to try to, be, um, uh, to see how we can work as a guidance. Um, and let me start with uh, the fact that we used the renovation of the museum, which is a huge uh, renovation, as the window of opportunity to to start the real change. And we said this is a renovation, so it's of course a very physical extension of the, of the building, but we always said it's a new mental setting that we want uh, to work in. We also said that we pay attention to the collection, and it seems very obvious, but in the decolonization uh, matter of being a museum of Central Africa, many people said that we should get out of not only talk about the collection or refer to the collection, but also talk about colonial um, things that happened, about racism, about uh, societal issues uh, that we do not have much of a collection uh, with, but that, of course, is the, uh, the theme. Um, and then we really tried to, to say, OK, what are we doing? We are uh, transmitting knowledge, but we are also uh, constructing a forum for um, uh, discussing and encouraging uh, attitudes uh, that are not uh, um, colonial anymore. You have to know, for those that do not know the museum, this museum, uh, our museum, was really erased in the colonial period. It was for, during the colonial period, uh, run by the Ministry of Colonies, and it was like really set up as a colonial propaganda machine uh, till, uh, and you would think, till uh, independence of, uh, of Congo, but in fact, for a far longer time uh, than that. Uh, also, we said we want to uh, go into a new uh, and a more contemporary relationship or a relationship with contemporary um, Africa. Um, this is the slide we always use to explain why it is necessary um, to involve uh, people that do or that can take their, their identity from the collection and that, are the, that need to be involved because the collection belongs to them or also belongs uh, to them. And what we did is in 2001 already, we started a council of uh, people from uh, uh, organizations that represent um, uh, African communities. Um, in 2015, it was clear that for guiding the renovation, this was not enough. Uh, people from community said, but we do not feel enough as an expert to, uh, to, to talk to you about what you're doing. And so um, we, uh, together, we agreed that six experts of, uh, of African descent would be uh, nominated to guide the uh, renovation. In fact, it was only in 2016 that we wrote down for the first time the word uh, decolonization. And sometimes we, we really regret uh, uh, doing that because we did so, uh, maybe because we think it was a kind of a hip uh, term to say, and yeah, now we are we're decolonizing. But it was, uh, there was no clear definition. And, um, and that made that in the two last years before the opening, we were very uh, quite attacked uh, by people from the African diaspora that we were not decolonizing. Uh, in the meantime, decolonization had become what we call a container um, uh, concept. Everything that was wrong was, uh, everything that had not been done yet was, uh, was uh, decolonizing. So, um, uh, sorry. Uh, in fact, we, we discovered afterwards that we were using uh, um, uh, all the time two different definitions of uh, decolonization. The one was a very practical, almost museological uh, definition. It is uh, stripping everything we have, we say, we show, we display of its colonial uh, underlying structure. And maybe stripping is even a wrong word, because stripping means that you take something off and you throw it away. And of course, what we take off, we're not throwing it away, but we're showing it, we're displaying it, how the colonial 
uh, structure was, uh, uh, was made. Uh, but on the other hand, the uh, decolonization is not only this pragmatic, pragmatic museological concept, but it's also a political concept. It is about sharing power and authority. And, um, and then, of course, it's a completely different, uh, um, or not only complete, but still uh, different uh, discussions, because what, with whom are you sharing? And we had quite some, uh, some problems uh, with whom we are sharing, because when we had our council, the council was with African communities in Belgium. But then, of course, our scientists working and curators working said, but we should much more share with African people living in Africa. And they do, uh, certainly in the Belgian context, have different opinions. Experts in Africa of scientific institutions do have different opinions very often are more conservative on, on what we think that, that, that we think and that the African diaspora in Belgium thinks. For instance, on the role of Leopold II, the king that for everybody, in, almost everybody in continental Europe and here in the room, I guess, is like a king who has, uh, uh, we should not be proud of, not at all. Uh, whereas if for um, uh, many of our counterparts in Congo, it is a founder of our country, and they did not see that problem so much. Also, uh, who are you going to, uh, to choose? Um, uh, just, just the people, just people from communities, or scientists, and, and we should share more with artists and with curators of African uh, descent. And what about Belgians and the children of Belgian people that lived in the colonies and that indeed for a long time already were involved, well, were not involved in the museum, but had close ties with the museum because of the history of the museum. And should we exclude uh, those? Um, when I say, I, let me give you an example of stripping uh, everything we have uh, as a decolonization as stripping. My favorite example is uh, uh, asking to visitors, true or false, African people have a natural talent for rhythm and music and dance. And the audience looks at me and always thinks there's a trick in it, but yes, but they do, they can dance well and they have music well, and then we explain, yes, but it is not a natural talent. This is what the colonial structure is meaning. We just do as if it is a natural talent, but in fact it is, of course, a cultural uh, talent. Um, so was this easy? Uh, not at all. Our council, um, in, in the, after 10 years of working with the council, we saw that we, more and more we had what we call the meeting tigers, people that really like very much to meet. And whenever younger people from the African community came, wanted to join in, after two, sessions, after two meetings uh, of the council, they run away. They say, we do not want to stick with, uh, with these people that like to meet. But, uh, um, so we had to find alternative ways for involvement. For instance, we uh, created Africa Tube, which was a group of young people from African descent that we said, would you please uh, check the internet and how can we uh, take from whatever you find on the internet, contemporary Africa, in internet, Afro art, Afrofuturism, etc., and make a room in the museum uh, on that. Um, another uh, problem was this, uh, the difference between scientific expertise and African expertise, and huge fights on, but what you're saying is not scientific. And so it, um, it was uh, a help, but only it came too late, that we used the concepts of saying, but there is scientific knowledge and their standpoint knowledge. And so you can have scientific knowledge sharing it with people from African universities, but you also need to have standpoint knowledge of people that are not involved so much in your uh, scientific uh, um, uh, thinking. Um, what we did there is just uh, change our rules. Huh? Uh, our new exhibition policy will be very clear. There will be not an exhibition if there is not a strong involvement, not just a weak, but a strong involvement of an African institute, an African curator, African scenographers, etc., so that we work together. Um, other problem is this discussion on who's right. And we try to solve that, but it is not easy to just to say, as a museum, we should be a forum for discussion, and we should not be the ones that are taking a position. But the discussion, it is a messy discussion. It is a messy problem. And so the dialogue and the discussion is, uh, is very important. And then in the end, when we really thought, well, this is, wow, we have done it, we were attacked. 
and we had to stay, well, you know, uh, it's only a start. Uh, and um, first it felt like we had to say it, and now we really mean it. We know that after, 50, what, after 18 years of working in a decolonized context, we're just at the start of it. Um, we are doing, uh, we are trying to do uh, much more because you can say it's a start, you can say it's a discussion and it's not right, but on some of the ethical points you have to be, to be clear. For instance, we said colonialism, even if you can understand it as a historical process, it is ethically wrong. No discussion about that, it is ethically uh, wrong. Um, also, uh, the, uh, you have to accept what is, what is wrong and, what is, and, and how um, new things that, you, that seemed wrong in your framework. And sometimes we felt you have to, to go even a little bit further. And I give you an example. We have one phrase and it says, uh, everything passes except the past. It's like, it's like a, a, a central phrase when you enter. And we had translated it in the three languages in Belgium and in English. And the press came and said, but why don't you use the Congolese languages? I mean, it's, you're still colonial. You're still talking. You're not putting it into. And we know from our linguists and our anthropologists, and even from in the exhibition room, that the African languages are oral languages. And we said, but you know, in the new National Museum in, in uh, Kinshasa, they will not write these African languages. So you, we don't do this. The criticism was so far that we said, well, you know, we put two more African languages. It's, we know it's wrong, but we um, accept it. Um, and finally, besides of being an open um, attitude for uh, restitution, we also feel that you do have to set the base limits. And the base limits are about democracy, about uh, enlightenment, about human rights. I mean, you can have multiple perspectives, but it, is, it must be clear that working on a European uh, continent, these are the base limits, and we do not want to have discussion on that. Thank you very much. We've got a few minutes for questions. There are a lot of you, so if you'd like to ask a question, could I ask that you um, stand up to indicate, and then the roving mic will come to you. Oh, stunned into silence. Over here. Hello. Oh, is it on? Hello. Hi, I'm Ellen. I work at an organisation called Historic England. We don't have um, sites or venues, but we deal with the built environment. And I was just wondering what your thoughts on and how we can decolonise the built environment, which obviously is, well, it doesn't have to be, but it tends to be permanent. Um, our, um, if our museum is a built environment. The museum was built by Leopold II. Um, and of course, the discussion in the renovation was should we should tear it down, there should not be. Um, the, there is a discussion also in Belgium and I guess in many other countries on the statues of colonial, uh, these kind of environments. And um, again, there is no one solution. But we think that the best solution is having a dialogue. We were approached by a, community, by a small community, a, small, a smaller village that had the statue of Leopold II. And they asked the Africa Museum to, what do you think and what should we do? And we said, you know, it was with the mayor. And we said, you know, but most probably you know who the African people, who the people of African descent or of Congolese descent are in your, in your village. Go and talk to them and make this, it is a local democracy thing. You have to, this is the, in the dialogue that you have to get out of it. And then together you will decide, most of the time it is like a little extra or a smaller or a bigger. Uh, extra plate on uh, saying what the colonial structure of this tattoo is. Uh, yeah, this sounds very similar to, to our experience. Very, very often uh, 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 there is this criticism of rewriting history or taking statues down and sort of pretend that nothing happened. And what we were also doing, uh, uh, like you described, is to add information instead of tearing things down. So we have a lot of colonial references in our building, and we're currently doing a project in identifying them all and then adding information. So what does it mean that we have this depiction of the Dutch trading or uh, farming or learning the 
the Indonesians how to, to, to do things. And this idea of us being better than them. And so we add, try to add it other than take it, take it away. Mira, do you want to add something? Um, no, I, I agree with these points, but just to say that um, that's part of a process of learning. So local democracy, adding more detail, um, and it leaves open the possibility that you might want to change something if the feelings are, are strong enough. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, my name's Rhiannon Mason. I work at Newcastle University. And my question was really for the last speaker, but if other people have thoughts as well, I'd be glad to hear them. So it was your comment, I think, where you said about the challenges of the museum being a forum from, for different perspectives, but you said it got messy. And you said just at the end that you used frameworks like human rights and democracy as sort of baselines. I was really interested in the times when you had those messy discussions where it wasn't quite so easy perhaps to to reference those sort of baselines so does that make sense is do you, could you just say a bit more about principles you used when it perhaps wasn't so clear cut uh, to refer to a set of external frameworks I'm afraid it's it's not so it's not so easy because we learned through the discussions I, I can give an example of how we try to be a forum, for instance, in our guided tours. We strong, first of all, we strongly encourage people to have guided tours and no audio guides, because audio guides is one dimensional, and you only can have a discussion in a guided tour with a, with a person. Second, we train our guides to, to try to have this, this discussion and to be the visit of the museum as a forum, and to, and to talk about and to, to change opinions. But then again, if the discussion goes like to the extreme and you're, you're taking away the, the, what we said, the, the limits we set, and we said this is our limit and we do not discuss on, on that. Um, the, um, the, the, the framework, you have to know that the African Museum, in fact, is also is maybe even firstly scientific institutes, more than 80 scientists working there. So the main framework was the, the scientific uh, thinking. What, what the people of African descent are saying, it is not scientifically true. And so that was the biggest challenge of, of getting multi-perspectivism, uh, multi because it is very difficult for trained, um, uh, maybe, uh, trained scientist to, to put away his limits and basis of a scientific foundation. Sharon from the Museums Association. Um, I just feel like I've got to say this. We've had a big debate um, over the last couple of weeks in the media about Naga Manchetti and her right to call out racism. And I think that's a red line. And so with the slide that you used, then, then I think a museum has a moral and ethical responsibility and duty to call out racism. And if that upsets some people, it needs to be done. Would anyone like to respond to that? Mira? Um, no, I think we agree, and this is, I mean, the tension, uh, one of the tensions is, particularly in an academic setting, um, people claiming academic freedom to cover um, attitudes which are racist, or believing that, you know, their uh, racialized attitudes are academically grounded. Um, this is a real issue, and it's, I would argue, and to some extent, it's in tension with the idea that science and education are collective endeavours, because academic also, academics also want to preserve their individual autonomy and right to say X, Y, and Z. Um, it's not one, frankly, that we've managed to resolve. I think, ethically, the right thing to do is to say, OK, I'm an academic, but I'm not an island. I have responsibilities to my community, to my institution, to my students. Um, I can't call their humanity into question. That's not up for discussion. I think that's a really good note to end this session. So I'd, um, I'll wrap up the panel. And then we've got a special announcement, um, which you will hear in just a sec before we leave. Um, I'd firstly like to thank the panel for sharing their wisdom in actually um, acting on um, concepts and issues around decolonization. Um, there's been an enormous amount of um, practical advice and reflection provided by the panel. 
please do and go and absorb it even when you've left this conference room. You have all the delegates' contact details. Um, speak to each other, respond to questions and answers, and uh, really try and make an effort to keep this conversation going and keep it at the top of our agendas. So please, can you join me in thanking the panel?